Whatever you do, don't have the kind of week that Frank's just had. <laughs> Thanks. Welcome to Twill, the week in health law, the In Like Flynn podcast of record for the discussion of health law and policy. We're recording this episode on December 4th, 2017. And Nicholas Terry, a law professor at Indiana University McKinney School of Law in Indianapolis, joined, of course, by my co-host, who is still devastated that he lost Suits actress Meghan Markle to Britain's Prince Harry and is... <laughs> Frank Pasquale, law professor from the University of Maryland School of Law. Well, Frank, I've been in Grant hell recently, uh, amongst other sorts of hells. But the other day, um, I did fire up my trusty iPad, and suddenly you were there on my screen, all smiling and bipartisan, with a nice suit and tie on to boot. <laughs> tell, tell the dear listener what you were up to. Well, this was a wild week. I had, um, so last week was, um, I had a tele-testimony for, for the National Committee on Vital and Health Statistics, or just sort of giving a presentation uh, for them, on Tuesday and then Wednesday was the House Energy and Commerce Committee, a sort of a subcommittee on digital regulation, I think. And we were talking about algorithms and uh, data. And uh, I'll try to put that up in the show notes, some links to the testimony. And it was a very interesting, spirited group of folks. And um, that was what I think you saw. And then Friday was actually a briefing with the House Judiciary uh, Committee on some antitrust issues. So last week, I was a little frazzled. But uh, I'm, thank you so much for your support, Nick, and for watching the hearing. It was great. I enjoyed it. Um, particularly, um, there were a couple of you who went over some of the um, the territory that we've explored here about the the bottom line utility of transparency approaches, which I thought came out quite strongly in the hearing. You know, that was such a fascinating dynamic. They had Omri Ben-Shahar there, the co-author of uh, More Than You Wanted to Know, which is a pretty devastating critique of a mm -hmm. lot of transparency initiatives, which echoes a lot of what we've heard from our show guests, ranging from Michelle Mello to, um, you know, earlier discussions about quality. And I think Richard Saver had some, you know, very interesting yeah, points the there. Sunshine Law, yeah. But I have to say, I think he went a bit far because it was it was sort of like I know that some of these things have failed in the healthcare context um, but I do think there are some things like calorie labeling other areas where even if you can't demonstrate that they change people's behavior it's still I want to know and I think it's okay for the state to require food manufacturers to say how many calories and how much fat and what's in food so you know I feel like that's uh, it was a little overstated but it was still a very interesting and certainly a lot of members of the committee took it to heart so when I saw the um, the slide he put up of the Apple terms of agreement that you just click on, I agree. Um, and he hung it up from the, um, the ceiling of Chicago law school. I think I was thinking, I wonder, I wonder what slide Frank's got. <laughs> I did not bring a visual, frankly. Oh, well, you know what the story with this hearing is I heard on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving is the first I ever heard of this. They told me we might call you. We you're, you should assume you're on, but you could be canceled on Monday. And I said, well, when will I actually know? And I basically said, I'm not preparing anything until I actually am confirmed. They confirmed Monday at 10 and I had to get my written testimony in by Tuesday at 10. So basically did not sleep Monday night. I got my call the Friday afternoon for a Tuesday. And, and this was your house energy and commerce yeah. one? Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's you, something uh, amiss, you know, with that. It, well, I mean, I always just assume I'm the fourth choice. <laughs> <laughs> Although sometimes if if you're the the minority party's uh, witness, you know you've you've kind of had to battle your way to the top of quite a few because they only get one or possibly two. So you know it's, uh, but yeah, it's very very difficult to get. It, certainly, this does not do our deliberative bodies much credit to give people that short a notice to comment on these things. No, I always imagine when I'm doing something like that, I'm standing on the shoulders of Nathan Cortez. Yes, me too. Yes, there are certainly the number of fantastic guests we've had that are uh, are people we can guide. And that's what I actually thought was most rewarding about it was the people I could cite in the written testimony and, you know, point people to exactly these folks that have done such amazing work. So, yeah. Well, talking of guests, in fact, talking of amazing guests, we have one of that type today, Frank. Wendy Mariner, the Edward R. Utley Professor of Health Law at Boston University School of Public Health, Professor in the Center for Health Law, Ethics and Human Rights at BU School of Public Health, Professor of Law at Boston University School of Law, and Professor of Medicine at Boston University. University School of Medicine. Professor Mariner's research focuses on laws governing health risks, including social and personal responsibility for risk creation, health insurance systems, implementation of the Affordable Care Act, 
ERISA, proving she's really smart, health information, privacy, and population health policy. A wonderful teacher and scholar and friend. She's one of our favorite Twill guests. Welcome back, Wendy. Thank you very much for having me. The three of us are going to look at uh, four or five of the big stories of the uh, the last week or two. I think we are going to have to rename the show this fortnight in health law, Frank, unless, unless something <laughs> changes in both of our schedules. Um, yep. So where I'd like to start is with with the Murray Alexander market stabilization package, which sort of disappeared um, uh, from view, but popped back in a story in Politico this week that Murray Alexander being put back into play, apparently, reportedly, was the price that GOP leadership paid for Senator Collins's vote for repeal of the individual mandate. However, as Tim Jost pointed out on uh, his always amazing health affairs blog, uh, the CBO has already noted that Murray Alexander would not have a positive impact on the number of insured after the mandate's repeal and would hold steady on its estimate of 4 million fewer insured in 2019, 13 million fewer in 2027. So I guess my sort of opening question is, do we actually believe that the Murray Alexander promise will be kept? And will there be any ameliorative legislation or more pick off the little pieces of the ACA type of approach, such as we've seen with the individual mandate being repealed as part of the uh, tax reform? Well, I will just jump in very quickly and say that the uh, old man in the sea metaphor, I don't know how many of our listeners have read the uh, Hemingway uh, story, but just tells the story of, I, and, I, and I'm sorry for the spoiler alert, but the man catches a big fish <laughs> and it uh, <laughs> ends up, uh, the, this ends up being somewhat of a ferric victory, uh, given that he has to drag it through the sea where it's eventually um, nibbled to death by lots of other predators. And uh, seems as though the ACA is uh, about to go through something quite similar um, with respect to this, uh, if this individual mandate goes through, uh, and it seems like it needs to go through because they need the money from the individual mandate repeal in order to pay for the rest of the uh, massive tax cuts for corporations and the wealthiest. And so, yeah, it seems like it's a pretty, uh, and the, the Murray Alexander, I don't really get how that is uh, is a guarantee to Susan Collins, although maybe the, someone maybe there are arcana of congressional bargains that I'm not aware of. I do remember when our show with Christina Ho, we discussed some of the uh, nature of congressional deals and rules of congressional procedure, and I'm going to have to revisit that literature, but I don't see much positive there. And I don't think that that, I think that was more in the manner, in the mode of face saving than in the manner of uh, actual health policy uh, retrieval or trying to save uh, the ACA. I'd have to agree with Frank. Uh, there was a time when a senator's word was quite good, and there was gentlemen's agreement. And it was, of course, mostly gentlemen. Um, perhaps now that there are women in the Senate, they don't have to bother. Uh, that's a different story. Oh, it's terrible. It's, it's, <laughs> it's sad but true, I think. Yeah, it's sad. <laughs> But I would be, I would be quite skeptical. I do think that the Murray Alexander was an effort to try and shore up something that, um, both houses seem, uh, determined to collapse. And I don't, I don't, without the individual mandate in particular, I don't see a lot of attraction uh, among the industry, the insurance industry to go after that, particularly when they're owed billions of dollars in risk corridor, non-payments, et cetera. So. It would be, I don't think it's enough. And I would, I'm a little surprised that Senator Collins accepted Mitch McConnell's, well, assurance, not even guarantee. One thing that did strike me, and I, I think I read just a couple of pieces on this. I mean, certainly on this show and in my classes, the three-legged stool has been talked about many times and the, uh, the beginning of the downward spiral if you take uh, one of the legs off the stool. But I didn't read a couple of pieces suggesting that maybe not having the individual mandate won't make that much difference. That runs obviously against uh, the uh, uh, all the estimates that have been made. But uh, it is interesting as to which subsections of the eligible might still purchase insurance, notwithstanding the absence of the mandate, just like some didn't purchase insurance because of the mandate. That's that's a very good question, and particularly the the individual marketplaces are such a small proportion of the total insurance market in the country that it may not make a dramatic difference.
difference as a whole. Um, it will make a difference to, I think, quite a few individuals who find themselves unable to afford the kind of insurance that they really need. These are the people who need the subsidies and may find themselves unable to purchase insurance if there isn't enough support for the industry to provide them with affordable premiums. Though, of course, your very observation that the individual market is very small does reveal the desperate need to have as many people in those pools as possible. Recall what we learned about the Iowa pool because of that single teenager with uh, hemophilia, as I recall, that uh, caused such a, a, a measurable blip up in the cost of, uh, of treatment and therefore premiums for that state. Well, I think we should go to the tax vote itself. The, uh, the Washington Post uh, greeted the morning after the tax vote with the news that the GOP would likely introduce major cuts to Medicare and Social Security. The Senate Finance Committee Chairman Orrin Hatch, for example, was reported as having attacked, quote, liberal programs, unquote, for the poor, and said Congress needed to stop wasting Americans' money. The, uh, the twistic logic, of course, here is that these cuts are necessary to cut the deficit because they just increased the deficit. Can you help me understand any of that? Uh, yes, this from a party that has prided itself on reducing deficits. But the idea of reducing entitlements, particularly Medicaid and also Medicare, not to mention SNAP and WIC and CHIP and other programs. This certainly didn't come as a surprise to any of us who have um, seen the, the goal to reduce spending on these kinds of entitlements for quite some time, either for ideological reasons or, or otherwise. And indeed, the, you know, the pay-go statute will probably force some kind of consideration of cuts to Medicare and Medicaid fairly promptly, which will put enormous pressure on trying to provide access to care. If there's insufficient federal funding for the states, they can reduce their Medicaid eligibility of the regular Medicaid beneficiaries. I am troubled by what's going on, but I want to just sort of try to connect it to the dialogue about health care costs. And I can imagine, I, I don't know if I've heard this yet from a Republican sponsor of these bills, but I certainly hear it in the education space where, you know, they're probably going to get rid of income-based repayment or they're going to try to in the Higher Education Act reauthorization. I don't think that can go through reconciliation the Way that some healthcare bills can, but you know, I think that they're going to be trying that. But what I always hear in the education space is, well, the more money we give to the sector, the higher they put tuition. So let's just really cut back on how much we subsidize it. And I, I'm surprised that we're. I, I'm imagining that what we're going to be hearing from the Peterson Institute or some other entities that are going to, you know, after remaining somewhat silent about the ways that tax cuts raise the deficit, that they are going to be running wall-to-wall -wall ads pushing for the resulting entitlement cuts, and they're going to say well, all these technocrats have told us that one third of healthcare spending is waste or fraud or something like that, over-treatment. Uh, we've, we've heard that on this podcast about the problem of over-treatment. So maybe this is the push the healthcare system needs to get rid of that low quality care. Is there any hope there or, or is that just going to be a completely disingenuous argument? Well, I think if you follow the history of how we've responded to that kind of funding hole, it's that you dig out of the problem by just rationing care by not providing it to an increasingly large number of persons. It, in, in the health field, we've been struggling with ways to be more efficient, to improve quality and reduce costs, and ultimately discover that there are probably only four ways to do that. One is to reduce administrative costs. Medicare has done a pretty good job of that. Uh, the second is to become more efficient. Well, there are a lot of experiments attempting to become more efficient, but they haven't necessarily become less costly. A third is to restructure or reduce benefits to patients and to reduce payments to providers. And Medicare has been been attempting to do that with its pioneer programs and Medicare savings programs, it has proved exceedingly difficult especially with Medicare patients who have chronic illnesses and are perhaps the most difficult to coordinate care for. There are some wonderful quality improvements in some organizations, but not a lot of cost savings. And it's in the provider side, payments to providers, where the bulk of the costs are. So it's, it's not an easy task, and I wouldn't hold my breath about quickly resolving the cost issue, even if 
we argue properly that there may be waste in the system. We haven't quite found the way to find it surgically enough. Wasn't it the CEO of Kaiser Permanente a year or two back who said in an interview that they'd managed to get, you know, to, to meet your admin and efficiency uh, argument, Wendy, they, they'd managed to, to get 10% out of it, but they couldn't seem to get below that. The, the fixed costs defeated even them. When you look at the new administration and its new super go soft micro um, uh, MIPS strategy, you know, saying everyone must go at their own speed, doesn't look like we're going to do a lot more in the value remuneration reimbursement area anytime soon. And as far as cutting prices at all, you've seen CMS now backing off the the really interesting joint program uh, for uh, you know knees and um, and hips with the, the the whole wraparound service for for a single charge they seem to be moving in the opposite direction from that we have a an hhs secretary coming in who has been very successful at uh, in the private sector at increasing the price paid for drugs so i'm i'm not sure i see any of your four examples looking particularly positive at the moment my point exactly yeah so then i guess what happens is I always uh, teach this as meat, meat axe rationing, where I remember one time uh, New Hampshire decided, this is in J- Jerry Avorn's book uh, on drugs, that New Hampshire decided that they were only going to cover three medications for each Medicaid re- uh, recipient. It certainly has to go down in the annals of healthcare rationing as one of the more uh, foolish ones. So then I, I'm just wondering, how will this work exactly? I guess if they've got to cut $25 billion from Medicare, do they ratchet down all the payment levels across the board? I mean, certainly it seems as though the Medicare Advantage plans have been pretty protected. So I imagine they're going to be not really going to bear the brunt of it, although they, they would be an ideal place to maybe impose those cuts. But... I guess that's where the conversation has to go is if you're going to be doing the pay go cut or sequestration type activity, then how do you decide? And frankly, I, I'm sorry to even broach it without really knowing much of an answer, but I'd love to hear from listeners if anybody has uh, the procedure or anything that is uh, likely to follow once those sorts of automated uh, budget cuts go into effect. Do you, I mean, I, su- I assume that things like the, the Part D donut hole come back where, where co-pays are permitted and and other um, cost sharing out to patients uh, are allowed under the programs, you're going to see fairly considerable increases, not only to recoup money, but also to make utilization less and less attractive. So essentially what you do is you, you don't so much in these programs increase the number of the uninsured, you increase the number of the underinsured. Ah, right. Well, that, that could be exactly exactly where we're going. If the if, if Medicare is going to have some options that would be amenable to um, many of the congressmen, uh, you, you might include uh, pr- premiums for Part A for those who stay in traditional Medicare, or you could get new proposals for privatizing Medicare, uh, which would, I think, result in uh, under insurance. Because once you outsource a program to a private insurer, somebody has to take a cut and that cut will therefore reduce what is available to the patients themselves. So those are possible options. Now, one result of that, if, if the payments to providers are squeezed enough, they are likely to look to commercial insurers to even up their payments to compensate for what providers providers may be losing under Medicare. And providers are going to be in a difficult position to push those payments with the with the mergers. Now, now some of the mergers have failed, obviously, so far among the insurers. But that may change, or insurers may decide to go beyond ACOs and simply buy providers, creating what could be called a wonderfully coordinated vertical system of complete financing and care. Or it could be considered sole source healthcare without patient choice. A lot of interesting options, but nobody. I don't certainly don't know which if any, might be coming. You two are just miserable pessimists. Um, uh, Clearly, we don't have to worry about (laughs) any of these things anymore because the world of healthcare is going to be saved by the latest mega merger. CVS has agreed to buy Aetna for a cool $69 billion. This is the latest mega merger that we've got to talk about here about a year ago, I think it was, Frank. Justice and the state uh, attorneys general sued to block Anthem's acquisition of Cigna and Aetna's acquisition of Humana. 
Turner and all of those ended up really badly. But this is going to be different, right? This is going to create a giant consumer healthcare company with a uh, presence in thousands of communities. Uh, the Aetna chief executive described the vision as creating a new front door for healthcare in America. There'll be a broad range of new health services provided by CVS to Aetna's 22 million medical members through its pharmacies and walking clinics, and it will simultaneously position Aetna to be more competitive with the United Health Group. So given my pessimistic contribution to the discussion, I asked on Twitter when uh, this came out uh, whether the merger would A, rein in costs and transform 9,700 pharmacies into community medical hubs, B, merely slow down Amazon, C, end an immense messy divorce in a few years, D, continue the trend of anti-competitive healthcare consolidation, or E, all of the above. Where would you like to start biting? Well, one answer is obviously all of the above. Uh, I, I thought that was an appropriate last choice in your tweet. <laughs> The, um, th there is one possibly good thing uh, that could come from this, and that might be uh, wrapping up the carve out of pharmacy benefits from overall health insurance benefits. Um, putting them together can ideally help coordinate care better, monitor medicines. Of course, Frank will notice that there will be even more healthcare data shared now uh, among <laughs> the various organizations. And so that might be a positive. Um, I, I, I'm again thinking this is this has a better chance because it's a vertical uh, acquisition mm -hmm. uh, rather than what can be seen as a horizontal monopoly. But it could still create quite a monopoly, I think. Another possibility is that the um, the use of minute clinics and perhaps expanding their the clinics that are going to be available with perhaps a wider range of providers in CVS um, could be valuable for uh, persons who have high deductible health plans. And CVS would like to attract those dollars of, of the deductible, which can be thousands of dollars, for flu shots and small care, minor emergencies, um, and perhaps get more purchases in the CVS store in addition. Beyond that, it it really could signal an, an alternative where organizations that finance care also begin to create provider subsidiaries. And again, as I mentioned earlier, the possibility of having a complete vertically integrated financing system that is uh, far more controlled than what we see with many of the affiliations that exist at the moment. And that's particularly, it might be particularly appealing to employers, assuming that this coordinated, consolidated system uh, could indeed squeeze out um, some savings by paying their owned em employees or contracted providers far less. Um, and of course, is it supposed to be a good consumer alternative, um, front door alternative? I've forgotten the exact phrase that he used, but it could certainly revolutionize the experience, but it won't necessarily be a consumer experience if employees have no choice but what the employer has provided for them, chosen the biggest, consolidated, cheapest organization. I think that's exactly right. And it, it reminds me of the recent article in Bloomberg Business Week on Centene, which uh, apparently is trying to take over lots of Medicaid and, and Obamacare exchange markets via narrow networks or ultra narrow networks, um, where a lot of providers agree to lower reimbursements and perform only the most necessary services. I would say that in terms terms of, you know, the overall antitrust policy here, it's going to be a really interesting test for uh, Del Rahim and the Trump approach to antitrust because as Lena Khan argues on her uh, entry into the um, uh, Law and Political Economy blog on vertical mergers, if we look at what's happening with respect to AT&T Time Warner, it does seem as though the Trump administration is announcing a major shift in terms of putting in more scrutiny of vertical mergers and more reliance on structural as opposed to behavioral remedies. They view behavioral remedies as a form of the hated regulation um, versus uh, 
a structural remedy, which they seem to be putting more uh, store in. And the question is going to be, you know, if they are serious about this, they're going to have to look at stopping the, uh, or at least really look hard at this um, Aetna CVS uh, merger and, uh, or the acquisition. And I think that they're going to have to essentially, uh, but if, if it is the fact that the ATT Time Warner was basically driven by political issues, then we won't expect it to go beyond there. So this is going to be very interesting for the whole future of antitrust policy, I think. I think you're absolutely right. Um, and I do think that the Time Warner is, may not be a precedent for some of the reasons you say. It may have been politically driven. But there's also a question of having that large at an organization in the information information space as opposed to the healthcare provision space. And there might be a distinction if one looks at this on the antitrust merits for arguing that ATT Time Warner is a different animal. Let's assume some of the positives, um, that despite your reservations about, well, now I can only go to CVS, right, as opposed to all Walgreens. But from a consumer perspective, now I know I go to CVS. Um, I don't have to worry about the insurance because this is sort of vertically integrated. I know what my costs are likely to be. I don't have to worry about whether I went to the wrong clinic and I might have to pay out of pocket, out of network for this one or something like that. Look at it from the perspective of Anthem and the kind of cost control that they can impose. Uh, CVS, I believe, already uses a more restrictive formulary than a lot of PBMs um, working out there. So Aetna can control costs, control retail medical costs by insisting people use these little community medical hubs, etc., etc. But the, the bit of this I don't really get is what is the negotiation like between Aetna and the big health networks that are going to be providing secondary and tertiary care in agreements and basically are seeing their primary care folks shut out by this vertical integration? Right. So the idea here is that we might see an exacerbation of extant inequalities between primary care providers and specialists because if the goal here is a sort of dock in the box um, primary care physician model where maybe we'd have a lot more access to care via primary care doctors being stationed at the CVSs, that clearly would be a, probably a loss of status and income for those physicians. Uh, I'm not certain of that, but it seems like that would be the model. And then the question would be, would you, uh, then would they'd have to spend some of the money that they make there buying into or buying the specialists that they otherwise, um, <laughs> but yeah, but I don't know. I don't know. It's all speculation, but it's a very interesting possibility. In it. But also re recall that this is going to be a uh, physician extender kind of care as well. This is going to be nurse practitioners and so on, more, more so than you would see perhaps in a more expensive primary care environment. For now, um, who knows what the future may bring. Uh -huh. um, it, could be, it could be anything. But we've one of the arguments in favor of this that CVS and Aetna make is that having these clinics available could reduce the use of the emergency departments around the country, which are very expensive. And what we've seen, even with um, those who have increased access to primary care under the ACA, is that emer the use of emergency departments is not necessarily decreased. And part of that is because primary care providers are not available 24-7 when people get sick. Now, it's possible that if CVS is open 24-7, and they're open much longer hours than a primary care office, they might be able to take some of that load off. But I don't know that it will take enough load. Now, this question of the emergency room is fascinating. And I just, I, I completely agree with your point, Wendy. And I wanted to also add that there's this very interesting struggle going on now on the press where, you know, Sarah Cliff and some of the folks at Vox really appear to want to be the Ida Tarbell of emergency room overcharges. And they're uh, really trying hard to use economic research, other research to indict emergency rooms for charging too much. But what's odd to me is that it just, I've read all their stuff and it doesn't seem to me though that they really take on the problem of staffing an ER 24-7 with lots of good doctors with top-of-the-line equipment. And it's just, what's strange to me is that, you know, whenever you hear people say that they've got 
some management, some man- magical management technique that's going to suddenly square the circle and solve the problem of costs, etc. I just end up being very skeptical about it because I don't think, I think that, you know, it's quite possible that both the left health or liberal health care technocrats at Vox and the uh, disruptionist uh, executives who maybe really love this uh, Aetna CVS merger, that they are going to end up draining a lot of money out of the emergency care system and ending up with uh, lower quality, at least for a certain group of cases. And perhaps the interesting thing to think about here is perhaps the model will be, and you'd expect this from a consumer market model, let's provide better, more immediate access to the easy cases while getting rid of some of the infrastructure of personnel and equipment necessary to really deal with the hardest cases like someone that you know has a stroke or uh, someone with a heart attack or something like that. And I just wish that we had a better healthcare dialogue that could get into those sorts of hard trade-offs. But yeah, but I think overall, it's it's something that really calls on us to consider what are the aims of the healthcare system, what are the minimum standards of these types of services, and do we trust very, very large corporate entities to uh, provide? Well, one of the goals in much of the dialogue in Congress has been to increase competition for the purpose of improving quality and reducing cost, and that's a longstanding goal. But competition makes, you know, in competition, uh, entities that want to compete with each other want to increase their revenues. And in a system in which we are relying on private companies to, you know, to improve, it's hard to reduce costs when your goal is to improve your revenues. And we've seen that over and and over again in the healthcare field, uh, because there is less control over what you are, what what the patients that you are receiving. All right. Well, let's just uh, shift uh, gear very slightly uh, to a couple of uh, smaller points to take us out of the show. The uh, contrast Contraception opt-out interim final rule that uh, came out of the gate in October. Um, there is now a published guidance from CMS on how uh, employers need to uh, um, comply with the final rule and some of the processes such as notifying um, folks as to whether they're going to continue coverage of um, these important benefits. My question, I guess, is I wonder how much data we're going to get on how this operates, because despite all of the Hobby Lobby, Zubik kind of litigation. It's my understanding that only a relatively small number of employers who are eligible under those very confusing uh, rules that even the Supreme Court, after they hit the party's heads together and asked them to go off and try and figure out a a better rule, couldn't, uh, that relatively few of these eligible uh, employers ever did opt out. Equally, we saw that, uh, I think, Notre Dame uh, immediately announced after the interim final rule was published that they were going to opt out and after a uh, significant furor, uh, reverse that. Um, So I wonder whether this will go down as one of those great non-stories or whether it will go down as a massive and cynical attack on women's health. Well, once again, uh, Nick, you you could be both. Uh, I'm glad you raised the Notre Dame example because um, after arguing that it was a matter of doctrine and principle, not to be complicit, as the word, um, in choices in covering contraception. All of a sudden, it didn't seem to be so important a principle or part of doctrine. So I hope it goes down as a non-issue. Um, and perhaps the furor over sexual harassment may have alerted corporations to be a little more careful about their women employees. Um, but who knows? All right. And Frank, one last question to you. Um, we had news this week, a couple of days ago, that the California Cottage Health System, which is a rather splendid name for a healthcare system, has agreed to pay the state $2 million to settle claims that the healthcare provider didn't implement basic data security uh, safeguards, um, violations of California's Confidentiality of Medical Information Act unfair competition law, and of HIPAA, because recall that state attorneys general get to enforce HIPAA privacy security breach for, uh, notification after the High Tech Act. 
Apparently, 50,000 patient records had been placed on a company server without encryption, password protection, firewalls, or permissions that would have prevented unauthorized access. And while investigating the first breach, the California Attorney General found a second breach involving another 4,500 patient records. So my question to you, Frank, is are you at all surprised that the first big data breach settlement of the year is coming out of the California Attorney General's office rather than out of OCR. <laughs> no, no big, no big surprise here. Uh, and it's uh, my great colleague, Danielle Citron, has written a wonderful article on state attorneys general as privacy enforcers, um, you know, looking at people like Lori Swanson in Minnesota, some other, you know, Eric Schneiderman, other leaders here. And uh, certainly, uh, I know Kamala Harris has gone on to the Senate, but has left a lot of folks in that office who are excellent in California on all these issues. So, yeah, it looks like we're going to be looking at uh, these state laws for a while. And I am wondering, you know, the one big worry I have is it looks like the net neutrality regulation is going to be uh, trying to preempt state efforts to make up for where the federal government oh, don't, is. Don't get me started there. <laughs> so I just maybe I shouldn't give them any ideas, but I, I just hope that the state attorney generals will be given a free reign to do some of the great work that they have been, uh, been up to. And yeah, uh, good job, California. I hope that in a future podcast, we might be able to discuss whatever opinion um, the Supreme Court issues in the Carpenter case about the third party doctrine. Uh, there was a wonderful comment from Justice Sotomayor in oral argument about a case of Ferguson, City of Charleston against Ferguson, uh, in which she summarized the case in fairly stark terms, saying, we said police can't get your medical records without your consent, even though you've disclosed your medical records to doctors at a hospital. A fairly strong restatement of Ferguson and protection under the Fourth Amendment. Now, that protection is from mishaps and mistaken disclosures has not, uh, has not been nearly as careful. <laughs> it's astonishing how what a large percentage of breaches occur in the medical system. And that was the week in health law. A big thank you to Professor Mariner for joining us. You can find her on Twitter at Wendy Mariner. That's W E N D Y M A R I N E R. Always wonderful to have you on the pod, Wendy. Thanks so much. My pleasure. It's lovely to be with both of you. We post our show notes at twill.com. I'm at Nicholas Terry. There's no H in that on Twitter. And Frank, where are you? this week in social media. I'm at Frank Pasquale on Twitter. Thank you for joining us and have a legally interesting but healthy week. 